What's up, agency owners? Jason Swank here with another episode of the Smart Agency Masterclass, a podcast dedicated to you, the agency owner that wants to know what's working for other people and hear amazing stories. And today I have an amazing guest who runs a really successful agency that has a really unique way for lead gen and building their business well over the multi-million mark and getting away from referrals, which like I always tell you, referrals aren't scalable. And uh, so let's go ahead and jump into the episode. Hey, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. So tell us who you are and what do you do? Yeah, so I'm Jeremy Moser. I'm co-founder and CEO of Usurp, and we're a performance-driven SEO and link-building agency that serves mostly venture-backed SaaS companies like Monday.com, Robinhood, ActiveCampaign, and a bunch more. Small companies. <laughs> yeah, very small. <laughs> small of the small. Awesome. And so how did you, uh, why'd you get into this life? Why'd you guys start an agency? Yeah, so like so many on the show before, you know, I really just fell into the world of agencies I actually landed a job out of college at kind of a generalized marketing agency and kind of web development firm based in Southern California. And at the time, it was a pretty small agency, maybe around 10 full-time employees. And I got to see it really go through a massive transition where um, the founders really started to split ways and kind of went in two different directions because they were just offering sort of different services that weren't super aligned. It was very generalized. The clients they were serving were kind of local small business companies, so not kind of the ideal clientele that even I wanted to work with or brands that I thought were, you know, really changing up the game that were interesting to work with. Um, and so the founders really ended up parting ways, went different directions, and I stuck with one of them and, and ended up spending about four or five years at the company, um, seeing it grow from me being kind of the only employee at that point upon the split to it getting to around 30 or so. Um, so I really got to see everything from start to finish, right? All the kind of highs and lows of an agency life, seeing it go from just the inception to a bigger team where there's actual organization and structure built out. Um, so that really led me to starting my own and, and kind of just seeing it from the ground floor, I think is a really cool competitive advantage, especially in the agency space to just see all the the trials, the triumphs, what worked, what didn't work is, is uh, you know, those hard fought lessons are kind of hard to come by. And I presume in the very beginning, you were probably, how fast were you guys growing? Were you guys were growing on referrals or how long did it take you to figure out, you know, to create a lead generation system? Yeah, absolutely. So at, at the first, I'd say, you know, up until around the 80K a month mark in revenue, we were pretty much exclusively by referrals or kind of tapping into our existing network, so to speak. So just going to people and saying, hey, like we're offering these services now. Maybe we've worked with you in the past in some capacity or done a partnership, really just tapping into the existing connections that we had and referrals. And yeah, it was, a, it was kind of a good growth path in the early stages, but we realized that it just wasn't sustainable if we wanted this to be a larger agency. If we wanted to reach multi-millions per year in revenue, uh, it just wasn't going to happen by us being a little complacent and just kind of expecting people to refer us that way. And so we really realized that, you know, we need to step up our game here from a lead gen standpoint, and we need to be active and aggressive about it because a lot of these deals just aren't going to be handed to us. So what was kind of the first things that you guys did? Because I know there's a lot of people that are where you were, right? And they think, well, we need to hire a lead gen agency in order to do this. And I actually think that's a mistake, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Um, sorry, lead gen agencies out there. But uh, so what was kind of the first thing that you guys did? Yep, absolutely. So the first thing we started to do was really build a presence on platforms like social media. So things like Twitter, LinkedIn, where we were doing a lot more organic content than we were, as you mentioned, like hiring a lead gen firm to do just kind of pure cold and mass outreach for us. Um, I'd agree completely in that those things can work later down the line, but you really need a lot of brand awareness for them to work. And so if you're in the early stages and you're just sending cold emails, it's really unlikely that you're going to land any high profile clients or any anything that you're selling high ticket services for. And so what worked for us was really, let's take the time to, you know, understanding that this is going to be three, six months down the line where we see any of this actually work and put the time in on things like social media. And so I actually started building uh, an audience and a following on Twitter as my kind of main social media. And I think right now I have maybe around 80,000 followers or something. So I've put in a good amount of time here in the past to two and a half years and really built up connections there. You can reach a lot of really cool founders or marketers or CMOs at kind of different companies. 
And uh, that was really one of the lead drivers for us, at least in scaling from that 80K a month mark. So what did you start doing on Twitter? And, and uh, you know, you're the second guest in a, in a recent times of saying like <laughs> they love Twitter. Like I honestly hate Twitter um, <laughs> and like I hardly ever yeah. get on it. Like there's just, I just hate it. But I'm just a grumpy old man, I think, these days. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. So Twitter, definitely I had the same feelings when I first joined. I think I joined maybe in 2017 and I uh, thought the same thing. I thought a lot of the tweets were like super cheesy or spammy or like it just wasn't a great platform to actually connect with people. And I think there was a big shift in how the algorithm worked on who was on Twitter uh, sometime around like 2020, 2021 was really when it started to pick up. Um, and so on Twitter, a lot of the content that I'd post would just be stuff that I was doing on a daily basis, really, and just saying, here's what I'm doing in my agency, or here's what I'm doing for this company, and here's what's working, and here's what's not working, and really just sharing kind of the wins or the losses that were happening at the time, and building up some of those connections with folks at different companies, and, and really started to find that the people on Twitter were actually folks in the trenches, they were actually doing the work, they were at these larger companies and this is the platform where you could really reach them on a personal basis versus something like linkedin tends to be a little more transactional you can kind of tell from the content that's published there it has a very strong sales angle people are trying to work their angles there they're sending you dms in this sales navigator like it's really meant for sales and connections on that basis whereas twitter was just more organic overall right you were just connecting with people you were meeting new people maybe you were actually meeting up with them in real life so twitter kind of reach that human connection on social media that was still a little bit on that business angle, whereas something like a Instagram, for example, is really more personal life. And so I found that uh, Twitter was just a really good medium to kind of connect those two worlds. I totally agree with you on LinkedIn. Oh my gosh. If <laughs> I am so cautious of who I accept yeah. a connection from because I know this automated chain is coming right after it. Like literally yeah, the instant like messages. A, yeah. It's like a it's like a train of spam coming my way <laughs> all the time. Every it's it's almost without fail. Yeah. And you can see it coming. You're like, "Oh." And there's a reason why like I have my like my company, you know, it says like helping agencies grow faster and that kind of stuff. So then I can see when it's all automated. And I'm like, yeah. "You motherfucker." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I've seen that before too. I've I've seen a meme around the LinkedIn outreach where someone set like the an emoji as their first name and they get messages that are just hey emoji as like the the first contact there and it's yeah, you can just tell so much of it is automated at this point and it's kind of a shame because I think LinkedIn has a lot of potential. It does. It, and I and it used to work really well until the spam you know, people just, you know, trashed it. And that's kind of how I yeah. used to feel about Twitter. I need to, and thanks for kind of coming back on, like hearing another person using Twitter yeah. more kind of in the middle of Instagram. Cause I love Instagram, honestly, like, yeah. and I'm not, I'm hardly ever posting any work. Like I went fly fishing yesterday. So yeah. I, for the first time and we caught 10 fish. And so I posted nice. those, right? Like, yeah, so it's like, awesome. yeah, it's more about that, but I'm, I'm glad uh, Twitter and, and thank you for sharing that strategy. Yeah. What else worked for you in, in building this brand and and uh, and moving up? Because you know, going from like eighty k in reoccurring to you know well over the three hundred uh, in reoccurring is 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 what a lot of people are, are trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. So another couple strategies that worked for us on kind of a baseline level are obviously anything around content and just funnels in general. Um, so that was creating content both on our own sites, on social media, but also doing it for third party sites. So going to industry news outlets and saying, hey, let's be an expert contributor at these publications. For example, um, I'm a writer at Search Engine Journal, which is like one of the top SEO publications. Um, I write for Entrepreneur Media, a couple other handful of select ones. And so that's been a good lead gen uh, for us as well and kind of a longer term play. Um, but some of the more unique ones and ones that have really driven some big impact for us lately have been around creating kind of foot in the door or tripwire offers, so to speak. Um, so for one example, we acquired a SaaS company called Wordable.io. Um, it essentially is meant for publishers to export Google Docs to their blog and with all the formatting, compressing images. So it automates and streamlines that process. Um, so we acquired that and it was doing around, I think maybe five or six K a month in revenue when we purchased it. 
And uh, we just noticed that we had, first of all, we had been customers of the tool for a long time. So we had known the value and we had been using it on a daily basis. And we knew that a lot of other SaaS companies were using this. And again, that's our primary target market for, um, you know, ideal customer profile for an agency services client. Um, and so we just thought, hey, we can we can buy this. We can get a little bit of cash flow from, from it, but we can also then go to these people, build relationships with companies that we may have never been able to contact before. Uh, we might have needed an intro there where we just didn't have one. And so that created a really good entry level foot in the door offer to where a good SaaS company could get in with us for, you know, whatever, 100, 200 bucks a month on this service or this software, excuse me. And uh, that just enabled us to reach out to people much more. And we ended up closing a good amount of deals from this acquisition overall. So we've already paid in full for the acquisition itself. Um, and then we obviously have those clients that, you know, stay with us for years at a time. And so it's been a really interesting way to kind of go about saying, how can I acquire not just an asset, but potentially other ways to connect with people to where simple cold outreach just wouldn't work in that, in that method. It's very clever. Uh, and then you probably put like certain promos in the admin when they log in or the login, right? So it's clever. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And then we've got, you know, them on the, the email sequences and we have ways to just connect with them and say, hey, we, we can also see the back end, right, of, of they're publishing this amount of content. They probably need help with the strategy or aligning it with marketing goals. Um, so that really gives us some really detailed insights to where you might just not be able to get that information without having, you know, a discovery call with the client. No, it's very clever. And and I like that you used a company that you used, that you knew, that, that was probably yeah. undervalued. And then you could use that as as your foot in the door in order to, to get in and build that relationship. It's uh, very smart. Going back to you writing for some of these publications that your audience is, is, is reading, are you interviewing people that you want as clients? Yeah, so we've done that a good amount in the past as well. And we've done it even for our own content on our own site. So we do a lot of things around industry publications, around kind of unique data sets has been a really big key for us. Um, so this is more along the lines of like almost digital PR style kind of content campaigns where, for example, recently we created one around uh, surveying, I think it was 800 plus SEOs at different companies, ranging from in-house to agency to consultancies, all these kind of different sectors of SEO. Um, and we created a unique data set there just talking about everything to do with link building, digital PR, off page all these interesting data sets and uh, just went to journalists, uh, media expert panelists and interviewed them, surveyed them, got their data, um, and then ended up sharing that with a lot of different news outlets, more niche ones, also larger ones in the space. And that really was a, a good launch pad for us in terms of generating leads. I think we earned somewhere around 250 unique referring domains pointing back to us. So a lot of different articles referencing us, really good brand building play to where folks looking for information around these topics are going to find us. They're probably going to end up needing our services at some point, or they're going to need some sort of consultation from us. And I think that's been a really key for us, a uh, really key factor for us in driving more leads. That's great. Off topic, or a little off topic, but in your, in your wheelhouse, what about, how do you see SEO changing or affecting podcasts or audio, um, you know, out there, obviously you see, you know, videos ranking high and, and that's a, that's a big part, but what about with audio? Yep, definitely. I think uh, podcasts from an SEO perspective are a really useful tool um, for a few different reasons. So number one, when you go on a podcast, you almost always get a link back from doing it. So, you know, if it's being published on someone's site or maybe on their blog or they're sharing it on socials, you're going to pick up natural links, which are always important in the SEO space as a whole. Um, also, just repurposing that content, right? So if you're uh, writing a piece around a similar topic that you just recorded a podcast on, you can take that recording, you can transcribe it into text, you can optimize that a little bit, add more content where needed, and really streamline the process. And we're also seeing that uh, from our own experiments that when you add things like a podcast or a video to existing content, you increase that time on page, you increase the value of that piece as a whole, you cater to kind of different readers or learning styles too when people are searching. Not everyone wants to read a super long form piece. So if you have a little bit of context, a little bit of information there, and then you include a podcast, there's a really big benefit there. Awesome. 
Well, so for everyone listening, if you guys don't have a podcast yet, <laughs> I'm not going to get off my high horse. Uh, you all should have podcasts. Um, it's a great benefit for everything from outreach to SEO to building and positioning your brand as the as that trusted advisor. So make sure you guys do that. Well, Jeremy, this has all been amazing. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you think would benefit the audience? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned in agency growth, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of folks listening might be trying to go from that 80K a month to 300, 400, 500K a month mark. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned recently has been not being afraid to shell out money for good talent. And at the start of an agency, if you're bootstrapped like I was, uh, it's really hard to hire that great talent early on because you just don't have the sustainable cash flow yet. And so you're really stuck hiring, training, creating tons of SOPs, things like that, to where anyone can kind of follow the process. Um, but once you do have that sustainable cash flow, you do have a good client base buildup, you should absolutely go all in on that. I've really found that really without failure each time that I get uncomfortable with the amount that I'm about to pay a new kind of expensive seasoned senior hire. It's, it ends up freeing so much time for me that the revenue starts to just climb aggressively with each time I do it. And so now I'm constantly looking on a daily basis and just saying, what am I doing right now that someone else who's an industry expert can do and take off my plate so that I can just focus more on doing more marketing activities, building a bigger team, growing the demand, increasing the pipeline, doing things that are going to further the revenue versus doing a lot of the day to day. And I think that's been a really key switch for me. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. What's the website uh, people can go and uh, check out the agency? Yeah, so we're usurp.io. It's U-S-E-R-P.io. And then also wordable.io is our SaaS company if you want to check it out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jeremy, for coming on the show. And if you guys enjoyed this episode and you really want to take your agency to the next level and really be around the best agency owners in the world where they're sharing what's working, what's not working, having a ton of fun. I would love for all of you go to digitalagencyelite.com and check that out. And it might just be the thing that will take your agency to the next level in the mountain that you're climbing. So until next time, have a swank day.